of, uh, I'll, I'll do this uh, in English for the benefit of our guests. So uh, uh, I'll make this brief. It's always uh, fun when you're coming as a banker to academia and you're the only one wearing a suit, so uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, Professor Curry, Professor Posner, uh, uh, dear guests, and of course the family and friends of uh, Professor Berglas. It's, uh, it's always a great pleasure to be here to, to open this, uh, this uh, yearly seminar in, in, in his name. Banco um, uh, Pecca So obviously a lot of people here know, know Professor Berglas and, and I think what uh, uh, made him such a, a unique figure in uh, Israeli economics is, is versatility. I think uh, uh, starting obviously with academia where he worked on a variety of subjects from micro, public finance, obviously uh, uh, very, very important works on, on defense economics and other other matters, and always, uh, uh, if you if you look at the publication, always the, at the highest uh, academic level. Uh, his work at the, at the public sector, where uh, as director general of the Ministry of Finance and other roles, and also his his very very key role in, uh, in the stabilization program of 1984-1985, uh, which which I think is uh, is the most important turning point in the Israeli, uh, Israeli economy, which even today we still see the ramifications of that program on uh, how, the Israeli economy, how the Israeli economy is. And his, his work in business, uh, uh, most importantly in, uh, in Bank of Paulim, with, uh, where together with, uh, with Amir Sivan, his, his close friend, they brought Bank of Paulim uh, uh, from the brink of, of bankruptcy to be the leading, uh, uh, leading financial institution in Israel. And from what I know, and obviously I'm much closer to that area of, of his work, his, his, he had a, a very, very important role in helping steer the bank through very, very troubling uh, 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 conditions, uh, uh, and together with management, bringing it uh, very, very, very smart at where it is, uh, where it is today. But uh, uh, I think from what, what I've heard and, and, and seen, probably his, his most uh, important, uh, the most important aspect of, of the way he, he, he conducted himself was, was his practicality. His ability to take uh, uh, the theoretical models and apply them both scientifically and intuitively to, uh, uh, to problems, to economic problems, I think from what I, I understand and heard is, uh, uh, was probably one of the most unique features which we don't always see when uh, 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 dealing with, with, with academic, uh, uh, with people who are, come from the academic sector. And actually, I spoke uh, recently to one of uh, Israel's uh, uh, foremost economists. I, don't, I, won't, I won't name him because uh, he didn't allow me to. But he said uh, about Professor Berglas that if, if he saw he knew of a problem, an economic problem in the world that uh, needs solving, he would take uh, 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 10 people in the room in the world, out of the people in the world, one of them would be Professor Berglas to solve that problem. And I think that says, uh, that says it all. So I think uh, for us it's always a pleasure to, to have these, uh, these seminars where we, we get to learn about uh, 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 new development and important models in the economic world. And uh, I thank you always uh, for allowing me to be here. Thank you. Professor Posner. So before we move to the talk, I would like to invite uh, students who won the school prize for excellent works. Uh, I would like to first invite Yanai Shanan. So Yanai is a PhD student and he wrote a paper about the effect of child labor restrictions on fertility evidence from the early 20th century. Yanai. under the guidance of Analia, Analia Schlosser. Uh, next, I would like to invite Yam Mayan. Uh, who under the supervision of Neil Gandel wrote about the use of the history of economic thought as a pedagogic tool in the intro to econ course. Try to translate it from Hebrew. <laughs> And finally, uh, Brit Sharoni, who's also an MA student, who wrote under the guidance of Tzachi Gilboa about predictions and refutations 
players reasoning on and off the equilibrium path in imperfect, imperfect information game. Perfect information game. Uh, so, um, we move to the talk. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Janet Curry. Uh, she's the Henry Putnam Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton University, and she will give the Berglas talk uh, this year. And Janet has made a tremendous contribution to our school. She was the advisor of Dan, Dan Zeltzer, who joined us last year, and is one of the most promising, our most promising uh, young faculty members, so I will let Dan uh, introduce Janet. Say a few words. So, um, this is basically off protocol, but it's really a pleasure for me to introduce Janet. Uh, and, um, you know, Janet has, has done many things. She's the um, professor of economics in Princeton. For the last four years, she was the chair of the department. She directs the Center for Health and Well-Being uh, in Princeton. Uh, she was a vice president of the American Economic Association. Uh, she is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, and the American and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Academy of Political and Social Sciences. She is a fellow of the um, Society of Labor Economics, the Econometric Society. Uh, she directs uh, now co-directs the NBR program on family and children. Um, and she has honorary degrees from uh, Lyon and Zurich. Um, but really, I think what um, uh, makes Janet uh, stand apart, uh, in, in my view, is that she knows how to really work on really interesting stuff that everyone cares about a lot. And in, and in um, the, uh, many years, this has been uh, showing uh, how important is our early life uh, child development uh, in even in utero development to later consequences in adulthood, uh, and showing that actually targeting these uh, times where uh, babies are not even born or, or just after they're born uh, is uh, tremendously helpful to uh, influence their later adult outcomes. Uh, and of course, um, you know, this is what uh, basically she pioneered this area of. Um, uh, child development and early child uh, research. And uh, this, of course, is published in the top uh, journals in economics and, and beyond, and was covered in the media, uh, you know, just to name a few outlets, uh, the, Econom the Economist, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and I think what, uh, again, uh, is really unique about Janet is that, how, you know, however, uh, time-consuming all that is, she somehow managed to do a lot of service to the profession in addition, uh, uh, beyond even just serving as the, on the editorial board of science or QGE or uh, JEL, uh, she's and doing, m receiving multiple excellence in referring award before that. Um, she received an award for furthering the uh, status of women in economics and won multiple uh, best advisor award. And really, I, I think, uh, she's known among her students as some of incredibly being able to kind of get your work to you back in a day with lots of good uh, uh, feedback. I can attest to that firsthand. So again, it's my real delight to uh, have Janet uh, speak here tonight. Um, and she would talk about, um, a, 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 I mean, part of her more recent work uh, is about uh, socioeconomic differences and access to healthcare and mental health and she will talk about a small area variation in physician decision making, uh, the case for uh, depression. Thanks. So, uh, thank you, Dan. That was a very nice introduction. It's really a, a very great honor to be here and to give a lecture to commemorate Professor Burglas, who, who was a very great economist. And uh, sorry, I'm just trying to do something with this, but I'll forget about it. OK, so uh, as Dan said, I, I've done a lot of work on early childhood. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about a relatively 
new, newer line of research for me, which is trying to look at physician decision-making. Most of this work is done with Bentley McLeod. And so today I'm going to talk about, as the title says, uh, what people call small area variations in medical care. So just to um, give you some broad overview, the one reason for starting to look at this is that there are a lot of theories about how physicians behave, and most of them treat physicians as if they were... Make this screen. Okay. We'll make the screen look better. Yes, thank you. Uh, most of them uh, treat physicians as if they were machines, like every physician facing exactly the same problem will make the same decision. But one of the interesting things about physicians is that that probably isn't true. It seems like faced with exactly the same problem, different people make different decisions. And that's kind of the aspect that I'm interested in. So we want to look at this heterogeneity between physicians. I'm going to offer a kind of a framework, a model for thinking about that, where the basic idea is that there's a trade-off between doing what is the best thing on average for a patient, um, or experimenting and finding out about things that might work better for that particular patient. And so uh, I'm going to think about that in the context of a very big literature that talks about variations across geographical areas in what doctors do, and uh, says that what we should do about that is introduce practice guidelines to reduce that variation. And the context that I'm going to give, or my big example, is going to be the case of depression, which I'll argue is an interesting case to look at. So as a sort of a roadmap, I'm going to give you some background talking about what are these small area variations, why antidepressants are an interesting case study, um, some previous ex approaches to trying to explain them in the economics literature. Then I'm going to introduce the model talk about this relationship empirically between experimentation and outcomes. And then at the end, I'm going to simulate the model to give a little bit more insight into what parameters of physician decision making might be important. OK, so these small area variations were introduced to the literature in an article in Science in 1973 by two doctors who were looking at data for Vermont, which is where they were, and just noticing that in the data there were these incredible variations in the number of hospital days for different types of procedures. So, you know, in some places in Vermont, there would be 17 days in the hospital for tonsillectomy every year, and then in others, there would be 314 days per 10,000 people in the hospital per year. So they just looked at this and said, this can't possibly be because there's a difference in incidence of tonsillectomy. Or another example they gave was uh, appendectomy. It can't be that there's such a big variation in appendicitis, so this has to be differences in, in treatment. Oh, there we go. So this idea has really caught on. Um, a group at Dartmouth started publishing something they called the Dartmouth Atlas, which is an atlas of variations in medical spending and use of medical care. Uh, they use data from <coughs> Medicare, which is a health insurance program that covers everybody over 65 in the U.S. And what is in this map is an uh, illustration of variation in spending per Medicare enrollee across areas. Uh, these areas are collections of counties called hospital service areas. So what this shows basically is that there's a two-fold difference in spending between the high spending areas and the low spending areas in the United States. And there's lots of different uh, variations on this theme. It's also been picked up internationally. So this figure is from an OECD publication, uh, and you can see Israel is here. And they're just comparing across areas, in this case, hospital days per uh, 100,000 population. So you can see in, in Israel, 
the variation is between about 10,000 days per 100,000 and 15,000 days per 100,000. In some other places, you have even more variation. Like in England, it's a threefold difference between the low hospitalization areas and the high hospitalization areas. So there's lots of people going around trying to document these variations now. And uh, what the assumption is, is that these show that there's a lot of inappropriate procedures and a lot of inappropriate medical care being used. So uh, just from a publication from the National Health Service in England, I, I took this quotation where they say that you can use these variations to try and locate areas where there's a lot of wasteful spending. And then when you see these high spending areas, presumably you could take some of the money and use it for something that's more constructive. So that's kind of the idea that, that policymakers have about small area variation. And one reason why they have that idea is because often when people try and look at these variations across areas, they don't find a positive correlation between spending and outcomes. And in this figure, uh, which is from a paper by Kate Baker and Amitabh Chandra, they actually see a negative relationship between some of the measures of quality of care that they look at and spending. Okay. So that's the response then is to say, well, you know, if there's all this wasteful spending out there, what we need to do is go and impose guidelines on doctors so that they won't be doing these, these crazy things. And so the OECD publication where I took this figure from says, well, what you should do is first go out and document these differences, and then you should develop practice guidelines that are intended to reduce the variation. In the economics literature, people have looked at these variations and come up with a variety of different possible explanations. I think the most obvious one is that, well, maybe people are just different in different areas. In some place, they might be older or poorer or sicker, and then they need more medical care. Another idea is that there, there might be spillovers between doctors that cause differences in specialization in different areas. So, uh, for example, for heart attack treatment, if you have broadly two different types of procedures, one is surgery and another one is some kind of drug treatment, depending on where you go, you might get a place where people know a lot about how to do surgery and another place where they know a lot about how to do drug treatment. And so if you're in the place where they're really good at surgery, you probably should be more likely to see surgeries there than if you're in the place where they're really good at drug treatment. Okay? So that is a possibility. Another possibility that gets a lot of attention, especially uh, in the US because of the way that medical care is financed, is that there's just incentives to do more aggressive treatment. So, uh, you know, if you take your car in and the mechanic says you need to replace all these parts, you feel a bit skeptical. Uh, and when you go to the doctor and they say, well, you need to replace all these parts, then people tend to be less skeptical, but maybe they, they should be more skeptical. And then a fourth thing that's been suggested in the literature is that there are idiosyncratic differences in physician practice style. And I'm going to talk a lot more about that. So uh, to take these in turn, do patients differ across areas? Well, of course they do. Um, so the question is, how much do they vary? And does it explain all of this variation in access to or use of medical care? Uh, and I think the, the paper that's the most relevant to this discussion is one by Amy Finkelstein, Matt Genskow, and Heidi Williams, where they use a large sample of movers in the Medicare data. So again, these are all people over 65, to try and sort out how much of it is the patient and how much of it is a, something that's associated with the place where they are, the supply side. And they come down with the estimate that it's about 50-50. So there is important variation across places in the kinds of patients that live there, but it can't explain all of this variation, and there's still something to be explained uh, in addition to that. Now, um, I should say that in the economics literature, we tend to ignore that side of things. So for example, two uh, very nice papers trying to look at physician decision-making about drugs, 
So this, these are conditions where people choose one drug, and if that doesn't work, maybe they choose another drug. Uh, so they're trying to model that, and they say, well, we're assuming that physicians and patients are kind of a unit making a decision, uh, and there's no room for variation in practice style in that model. Okay, so they're explicit that they're kind of ruling that out. So this spillover hypothesis is most associated with Chandra and Steger in a couple of, of very nice papers. And um, I think the interesting thing about this from my point of view, and something that I'm going to show you some evidence about, is that it makes a pretty strong empirical prediction, which is that you ought to see more differences between areas than within areas. Right? Because if the difference between areas is because of specialization, that should mean that everybody within an area is doing similar things. Okay? And so that's something that one can look at. The evidence about this is quite mixed. A couple of papers look at spillovers in C-sections and find that even within the same hospital, you have a lot of doctors who have different C-section rates. Even in the relationship between like a senior doctor and the more junior doctors, you still see variations in the, the rates, which is really quite surprising. And then there's a third study that looks at cardiologists, uh, again, using a mover's design, and finds that with cardiologists, they seem to uh, change their practice style to whatever the local practice style is very rapidly within one year, and then after that they don't change at all. So it might be the case that they're moving somewhere because there's a practice style there that they, they like, rather than uh, that people in the area are, in, are influencing them to change in some particular way. Financial incentives, um, I guess I don't need to talk a lot about this, I just want to point out one reason why I'm going to look at uh, prescribing for depression is that I'm going to argue that there aren't strong financial incentives given that you prescribe one drug to prescribe one drug rather than another. So looking at that choice, there are not strong financial incentives to guide it. Now, idiosyncratic beliefs may sound like it's not a, a theory at all, but it has received some attention. Victor Fuchs blamed small area variations directly on idiosyncratic beliefs of physicians and the parochial nature of much clinical practice, which sounds kind of pejorative. And it was meant to be pejorative because he's arguing that higher spending reflects bad decision making and that if you could improve decision making, that you could lower medical care costs without harming anybody. So that would be a Pareto improvement. So this isn't, what I'm going to show you today isn't the first paper we've done looking at the importance of practice style. We have a couple of examples using uh, particular procedures which are chosen and are much studied procedures because they're kind of zero one procedures. So something like a C-section, you know, basically uh, in developed countries, every pregnant woman who's goes on to deliver a baby, they all go to the hospital. Uh, in every single case, you have a record of what decision was made. It's either a C-section or a normal delivery. Right? And similarly, for heart attack care, almost everybody who, who has a heart attack and lives long enough ends up in the hospital where they have a decision about should they do some kind of surgery or should they immediately start drugs. So we've looked at those examples and showed that uh, you can characterize physician practice style and that it matters for patient outcomes that doctors who are uh, more responsive to the patient's characteristics when they make a choice have patients who have better outcomes. Okay, so I'm going to look at antidepressants, which uh, I think it's a pretty interesting case. One thing that's interesting about it is if you're trying to characterize practice style, you need um, a condition or a procedure where there's a lot of data. And here, you certainly have a lot of data. So in uh, you, the US, now the most recent data is that uh, almost 13% of people over 12 years old are taking an antidepressant so at any given point in time. So it's really huge. 
Um, if you compare this to Europe, the rates in most European countries are about half, but then that's still, you know, six or seven percent of the population taking antidepressants. In Scandinavian countries, they're similar. If people get depressed in uh, Scandinavia, uh, and they're similar to U.S. levels. So I actually don't know what the, the rate is in Israel, but I would hazard a guess that it's also quite high. So a lot of people being treated for this condition. A second thing about it is that I would argue that given that somebody's receiving drug treatment, uh, an interesting thing is that the price of the drug doesn't really have much of a role for the people who are making the decision. Right? So you have, the, on the one hand, doctors deciding or patients deciding, but the doctor doesn't make any more money if they prescribe one drug rather than another. Okay? And in, especially in this case, most of the drugs are available as generics, so they're not even getting a, a kickback from the manufacturer, for example, to, to push one drug rather than another. The patient's payment, in most cases, doesn't matter uh, because the patient has a copay, so they might pay $10, whatever it is. Right? So neither one of the parties who are really making the decision care what the price is. So there is a price, and somebody pays it, but it's usually the government or an insurer that's paying it, right? So it's not really entering into the decision-making process. Also, unlike the previous examples that I gave you where it was just a zero-one decision, you either do a C-section or you don't do a C-section, something like treating for depression is very complicated. There are many possible drugs. We don't know if somebody walks in the door which drug is going to work best for them. If you read about it, most of the time they say, well, there's a lot of variation across patients, and what you got to do is you just got to try one thing, and then if that doesn't work, try something else. So um, that's kind of the guidance that's available to doctors. So I thought this might be a good example to think about from the point of view of other kinds of medical decisions, which are also more complicated than you know, just we do one thing or we do another thing. So, uh, given that I'm thinking about looking at physician practice style, we have to think about some way to characterize it. And uh, an important thing that I'm going to focus on following a lot of the other literature in this area is concentration of prescribing. And you can think of this as like what percentage of the time does a doctor choose their favorite drug and treat everybody who comes in using with whatever their favorite drug is. Uh, and so several different people have looked at this. And, uh, for example, this paper by Frank and Zeckhauser finds that about 60% of prescriptions for nine different conditions that they look at are for the doctor's favorite drug. They call this the I did it my way uh, prescribing norm. A paper that uh, is also in this line by Ernie Berndt and co-authors uses data on antipsychotic prescribing and finds even higher concentration that about 66% of the prescriptions are for the doctor's favorite drug. Another thing that they note is that there's a lot of variation within counties in what that favorite drug is. Okay, so keep that in mind when we're thinking about the spillovers uh, hypothesis. So I'm going to look at uh, concentration in prescribing for depression. I'm going to use the same data set that uh, Ernie Berndt and co-authors used, which is a data set that includes all prescriptions in the whole country for antidepressants between 2006 and 2014. It has a doctor identifier and some information about patient demographics and where the patient lives. So this data can then be merged to some other data to find out characteristics of the doctors and also some information about the prices of the drugs. So just to describe um, a little bit about how this market looks, this is looking at drug shares in 2014. And there were at that time 32 <coughs> different possible drugs, but 11 of them which are listed here, um, accounted for 99.7% of the market. Okay? Now, these drugs can fall into different classes according to their mechanism of action. The most common one is an SSRI, uh, 
and that's a little bit over half of the market. And then there's these other um, categories that make up the remainder. Within each category, there's a bunch of distinct drugs. So sertraline here, I've labeled that the, the molecule. Okay. Sertraline is the generic for Zoloft. Okay. So there's a single molecule, and it can be labeled either sertraline or Zoloft. Okay. So the molecule here accounts for 14.6% of the market in 2014. That was the most popular drug. And the specific product, the generic sertraline, accounts for 14.56. So the difference between these two columns is the amount that's accounted for by Zoloft. And so you can see that's a tiny fraction of, the, of, of this particular molecule. Okay, so that turns out to be kind of a feature of the market, which is that the branded drugs continue to be prescribed sometimes, but in very tiny quantities. Okay. You can uh, make a map, just like the Dartmouth Atlas, for these drugs and say, well, do different places have different favorite drugs? Yes, it turns out that they do. So the one I was just talking about, sertraline, is here in pink. Um, that seems to be very popular in California. And then other drugs, uh, like Celexa, that's this one here, the light blue, is the generic for Celexa, is more popular in this part of the country. Some of the other ones that come out are uh, Fluxetine, which is the generic for Prozac, or uh, Escitalopram, which is the generic for Lexapro. So different areas tend to focus on different drugs, just like we saw with the, the other atlases. And um, so in addition to the concentration of prescribing, an obvious thing to look at is intensity of prescribing. So how many people in an area get antidepressant drugs? And then you can also define, um, ask yourself, how different is this doctor's vector of drugs from some other reference vector of drugs? So I'll call that a measure of distance. So those are the three ways that I'm going to try and characterize doctor prescribing style. So looking uh, a little bit about at these numbers, annual antidepressant prescription rates per 1,000 people in 2014, it was about 784 prescriptions per 1,000, so almost one per person. Right? These are 30-day prescriptions. Uh, the number per provider is 305. But it turns out there's, this is very different across types of providers. So when I talk about antidepressants, you probably assume that I'm talking about psychiatrists. And there are you know, quite a number of psychiatrists, and they prescribe more antidepressants than other people. But there's not that many psychiatrists compared to general practitioners or family doctors. And so even though the prescription rate for family doctors is half what it is for psychiatrists, they're collectively prescribing most of the antidepressants. Okay, so most of the people who are prescribing them are not people who got specific training in how to treat mental health problems. And then another thing I was very surprised about is there's also these like 200,000 other specialists, not family doctors, not psychiatrists, who are prescribing antidepressants. So these turn out to be people like cardiologists, uh, OBGYNs, uh, uh, rheumatologists, those were some of the, the top specialties who are prescribing anti antidepressants. So there's a lot of doctors prescribing who don't necessarily have a lot of training to do this. Okay. Uh, looking at antidepressant prescriptions per capita, you see again a lot of variation. Some places you have more than two prescriptions per person. Other places, it's uh, 0 to 0.25. Okay. So to describe concentration, the papers that I mentioned earlier use Herfindahl indexes, which is sort of natural for economists, so it's, we're used to thinking about Herfindahls. I'm actually going to use the, an entropy score instead, and the reason I'm going to use that is just as it turns out to have some convenient properties. But whatever I show you for the entropy score turns out to be pretty true if I was using Herfindahl indices as well. So this is defined just as um, taking the uh, share of drug K times the log of the share divided by the log of the number of drugs. And I 
take the number of drugs to be the number of drugs that were ever available over the sample period so that the denominator isn't changing over time and changing the index. This measure is always going to be between 0 and 1. It has a unique maximum with equal shares for every single possible drug. And then there's uh, nk ways to get uh, minima, each corresponding to saying that all of the prescriptions are for a particular drug. And the uh, most useful property of this measure is that it's concave. And I'll show you why that's useful. Uh, here are the entropy scores by county for 2014. And again, like every other measure, you see a lot of variation by geographical areas. Okay. So this measure of entropy can be used to define the distance between two vectors of prescriptions. So you should think of this as there, there's 32 possible drugs. For every drug, I'm going to have a share. It could be zero, right? So I have two vectors of uh, 32 by 1, and then I can compare them. And uh, I can calculate this distance measure, which uh, by concavity is going to be 0 if and only if the two vectors are the same. And then that distance measure can be used to think about the sources of variation in medical care. So I can think about a physician J. Uh, and lambda j is going to be the share of prescriptions that are by that physician. Lambda r is going to be the share of prescriptions that are in a region. Okay. So I can calculate an entropy score using the data for every physician in the country. That's here. So that's a national entropy score. And then I can do it for each region as well using all the physicians in a particular region, and take the weighted average of those regional entropy scores. And that has to be greater than or equal to 0 by concavity. I can also do the same thing, just saying, here's the national score. Here are the physician scores. And let's just take a weighted average of all the physician scores. That has to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. And if I take the ratio of those two things, that tells me something about whether people are really similar within areas or uh, uh, across areas. Is the variation, uh, if this was equal to 1, then all the doctors in the same region would have the same practice style. Okay. And if it's equal to 0, that would mean that the regions all have the same practice style, but there's a lot of individual variation within the region. Okay, so it's just a way to measure the relative contribution. Um, and so just to make that a little bit more concrete, if you think about, OK, suppose I have two doctors in a county, 1 and 2, and there's two drugs, x and y. Each doctor prescribes half of the scripts in the county. One doctor only prescribes drug X, so they're totally concentrated, and their entropy score is 0. Okay? The other doctor only prescribes drug Y. They're totally concentrated. Their entropy score is 0. But if I look at the county level score, I've got half of the scripts going to each drug, so then that, the entropy score is 1. Right? So I jump from 0 to 1. And if I look at what the data looks like, um, you see, if I do it at the physician level, I get this entropy score. Then going from the physician level to the county jumps up. And then it basically stays the same as I go from the county to the state to the national level. And if I take that ratio that I was talking about, I get a number that's much closer to 0 than to 1. So that's just a way to formalize the idea that there's essentially more variation within areas than there are across areas, even though what everybody has been focusing on in the literature are these differences across areas, and they haven't really been paying very much attention to the variation within areas. Okay. So these, um, uh, another way to look at that is by saying, uh, and, and to more directly test the spillovers hypothesis about whether doctors are all the same within areas, is to say, well, if I look at the distance between a doctor and the average doctor in their county, 
how does that compare to the difference between a doctor and the average doctor outside their county who's like them in some way? So I choose doctors who are from the same cohort, graduated medical school at the same time, and graduated from the same kind of medical school in terms of the rank of the medical school. Okay? And so uh, if I didn't tell you what axis was which, you couldn't tell, right? Because they're all lined up right along the 45 degree angle. The doctors who are different from other doctors in their county are also different from other doctors outside their county. And you can't really tell the difference. Right? Uh, and that's true both for the GPs who are over here and for the psychiatrists who are over here. And then a, a final thing I can do on this kind of theme is to say, well, what if I look at the distance between a doctor and other doctors and see how that changes over time with their time in practice? So along the bottom here, I have um, years of practice. Okay, so going out to 40 years. Um, these doctors start being measured the year that they graduate from medical school. Most of them do some kind of residency or further training uh, during these couple of years here. And then by year four or five, they're in, going into their regular practice. Okay, and what you can see is, um, say if I look at this line, that once they kind of go into their regular practice, they don't really change very much in terms of their distance from other doctors. Okay. Uh, and also, this is for distance from other doctors in the same county. And if I look at the same picture for distance between other doctors outside the county, again, the patterns look very similar. Okay? So I just have some doctors who are different from other doctors. And it doesn't really matter if I'm comparing them to people within their county or people uh, outside, a reference group outside their county. Okay. So, what I'm trying to, uh, what I hope to have convinced you of so far is that there is idiosyncratic difference in practice style. There are doctors who are just different from other doctors. Okay, and so now I want to think about and characterize how, how they're different. So I'm going to do that first uh, with a very simple little model where we think about there being um, two drugs and two time periods. Okay, so we have two drugs. A and B, and um, at each point in time, we can observe the patient's condition. So here, Y is going to be the doctor's uh, observation of the patient's condition. And the patient's condition at T plus 1 depends on what drug they were taking, and that could be no drug as a possibility, plus some error term. Okay? And I'm going to think about this. This error term is going to be really important in the model because the error term is going to be how good am I at telling how you are. Right? So some doctors are going to look at you, and they're just not going to be able to tell um, uh, what kind of state you're in. Okay? So that error term is going to have a variance. And uh, 1 over the standard deviation is going to be the, the precision that I'm going to talk about. Okay? The drugs also have different effects, and the doctors have some beliefs about what the effects of the drugs will be. They uh, have some mean expectation of what the effect will be, and then they also know that there's some variance in the effectiveness of the drugs. So different drugs are going to be effective for different people. And so the precision about the effectiveness of the drugs is going to be given by PA or PB. So in this little two-period model, the timing is that first you evaluate the patient at time zero. So you observe y0. Then you choose a drug. Then you observe y1. And you choose maybe a new drug. And you observe y2. And that's the end. Okay. So uh, to close the model, we need to have some idea about what the physician's preferences are. And I'm going to assume in this model that all the physician cares about is how well the patient is doing. So they want to make people better. They're altruistic physicians. And so um, they care about how you are in period one and how you are in period two. But they could put different weights on those two things. And so the weight is going to be this psi term. And so you could think about that as 
the way that the doctor thinks about making you better right now compared to making you better in the future. And then I'm also going to assume, uh, for the sake of argument, that drug A is more effective than drug B. Okay? And in that case, if I only care about making you better right now, what I should do is I should choose the drug that has the biggest expected value. So then the treatment is obvious. Okay. On the other hand, uh, if I only cared about making you better in the future, then um, there could be some information to be gained by trying out the other drug in the current period, uh, observing what happens, and then making a decision about why too. So uh, in, in the paper, which is in the process of being written, um, we prove that you, you can uh, characterize the value of information in this little model uh, as follows. Okay, so here's the expression for the value of information. Uh, it depends on this parameter s, where s is uh, a function of both how good the doctor is at diagnosis and also how uh, much variation there is in the beliefs about how effective the drug is. It also depends on the difference in the expected value of the two drugs. And this L is the, the unit normal linear loss function. Okay. So what this tells you, actually, is that experimenting with the drug at B has more value than giving the drug A, if and only if there's a lot of of potential value to doing an experiment. Okay? And so when is it helpful to experiment? Well, it's more helpful to experiment if the difference in the expected values of the drugs is larger. Right? It's also more useful to experiment if I'm really good at seeing what your condition is. Right? So if I can learn something from doing the experiment, then it's going to be more valuable. And um, also, uh, you know, for, mo for most cases, the psi is going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. And so the physician is going to choose drug A if and only if this expression turns out to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So here we have some parameters that can affect what a doctor chooses to do. So one of them is how much I care about making you better right now compared to in the future. Another one is going to be, what's my time horizon with the patient? So do I have time to experiment, or am I just treating them and then they go away? Uh, another one is going to be the diagnostic skill of the physician. So how good am I at learning from doing the experiment? And then it's also going to depend on things like the difference in the range of the drugs that are available. Okay. Now, uh, turning to my problem, it's not just like a two-drug, two-period problem. It's a really complicated problem because I have, uh, if I take my, um, you know, my 11 drugs plus all other drugs plus no drug, that's 13 uh, possibilities. Um, so that would be like 300 trillion choices. So thinking about this as a dynamic programming problem is really not going to work. So what we do, since we can't just solve for optimal payoffs in a complicated problem, is that we use uh, an algorithm from the machine learning literature to try and set bounds on what the optimal payoff would be. And then this algorithm can also be used to simulate the effects of physician beliefs, the treatment time horizon, the diagnostic skill, to see what would be the effect on, on patient outcomes. Okay. So in the multi-period problem, I have sort of a generalization of the utility function that I was using before, where the physician cares about the patient outcome in every period. And I care about the difference between their outcome and what the optimal outcome would have been if I had picked the best drug. So in every case, I want to m minimize that distance. Okay. And so what that boils down to is saying, I want to minimize the number of mistakes. There's some E star out there, which is the best I could possibly do. And I want to, over all the periods of the data, um, uh, hit that target as many times as possible. 
and that would be the, the optimum. So for a uh, decision problem of that form, I can show that for any period t, the payoff satisfies this restriction. Okay? And so what's useful about this restriction is that essentially it shows that there's an upper bound on utility which means that physicians have to experiment in order to find the optimal treatment. Okay, so if, there, if there's a very complicated regime out there, uh, there's basically no way that I can find what is the best treatment for the patient without doing some experimentation. Okay? And the flip side of that is, if I do experimentation, then I'm going to make mistakes. Right? So mistakes will be made, and that's the only way to get to an optimal treatment. So in this, um, uh, the way you implement this upper credible bound um, algorithm is you say in each period, you're going to update the doctor's beliefs. The doctor's beliefs depend on um, information set, which is your beliefs last period, the patient's condition, and what drug they were taking last period. Okay. There's a, a parameter which I'll talk about a bit more in a, a minute. And then you calculate for each drug uh, an upper credible bound. So that just means the best that it could possibly do. What's the best case scenario for every drug? And then you choose the treatment that gives you the best case uh, scenario. And then you do it again. Uh, and tau gets smaller over time. Uh, and you eventually converge to the optimum. Okay, so um, just to give a really simple example, if I had two drugs, these are my two drugs here, one of them has a bigger expected value and a tighter confidence interval, but this one here might actually be better. Okay, so in this example, I would first choose this drug, and then once I see what the effects are, I can narrow down the confidence interval that I have, uh, and in this case, then I would switch to this drug in the next period. Okay. So what the machine learning people have shown is that this kind of a search algorithm will eventually get to the optimum. Okay. Okay. So again, the implications here are that in any point in time, the physician may be treating, facing a trade-off between doing what uh, you know, it's the best thing on average for a bunch of patients or trying the thing that has the highest possible payoff for you. And this trade-off is going to depend in part on the physician's beliefs about the drugs, on how skilled they are at their diagnostic, uh, at diagnosis, on their time preferences and also the time, uh, time that they have with the patient. So to take the model to the data, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that my entropy measure is capturing something about the physician's uh, willingness to do experimentation. So higher entropy physicians are going to be ones who are experimenting more with different kinds of drugs. And I'm going to look at how that measure of experimentation affects patient outcomes. And there's going to be three different kinds of, of patient outcomes that I can look at. At the county level, I can look at emergency room admission rates. At the physician level, I can look at the prices of the drugs that they're prescribing, and also whether they're using branded drugs or whether they're using contraindicated drugs. And in this example, the contraindicated drugs are mostly contraindicated drugs for the elderly. The reason why they're contraindicated is because they can make people dizzy, and for elderly people, falling is very dangerous. And then at the patient level, I can also look at their total costs and then break down the costs and also look at whether they ended up in the emergency room. So the reason why emergency rooms are a big deal here is because if a person is having a mental health crisis in the US, and I think in a lot of other countries, they're told to go to the nearest emergency room. Uh, and then they get triaged from the emergency room and maybe they get sent to a mental hospital or something like that. Okay. But a lot of people end up in emergency rooms. Um, 
yeah, I think I skip most of that institutional detail and just go here. Um, you have, this is just a breakdown of ER visits per thousand population in the six states where I have data. And so what you can see is that uh, ER visits are pretty common. So on average, there's 380 visits per thousand. Uh, and actually, mental health visits are a pretty big fraction. So this is like 13% of all the emergency room visits. The way I'm coding this is if you have a mental health indication on your record, then I'm saying that it's a, a thing that had a mental health issue associated with it. And uh, you can break that down further. Some of these are substance abuse, so they might, yeah. Well, no, because this is things where they actually did something, right? So if, they, if you came in with a heart attack and then they gave you a psychiatric evaluation while you were there and they billed for that, then it would be on there. But I'm guessing that if you had, uh, like if you're being treated, yeah, so this isn't, this isn't your medical history. This is just what they're billing for. Okay, so they're going to put things that they can bill more for. And so uh, mental health conditions are going to be there if they did something because you had a mental health condition. And so for a lot of these people, it would be because they did an evaluation of you. you know. So you, you come in, uh, you know, you've injured yourself in some way. You're being treated for the injury. They find that you injured yourself because you have a mental health condition. Then they would do a psychiatric evaluation and then there would be a claim for that. Okay, so they are, they are a pretty frequent cause of um, emergency uh, bills. Okay? And so looking at uh, the ones that are relevant for antidepressant use, about uh, 19 of these per 1,000 would be for mood disorders and about 19 for some kind of anxiety disorder. Okay. So if I look at, at the county level, at how entropy scores are related to uh, ER visits, there's actually a, a positive relationship. Okay, so if I look at any mental health, there's a positive relationship. If I exclude substance use, I still get a positive relationship. And if I just focus on mood, anxiety, and, and psychotic disorders, I get a, a positive relationship. And that's controlling for county fixed effects and county year trends. Okay, so this doesn't look too good for the idea that experimentation might be, be helpful, but this is at the county level, so it's not taking account of variations in patients, right? You can't do that using county level data. Looking at the physician level, uh, I also doesn't look too good for entropy uh, in the sense that higher entropy is associated with higher prices per prescription a higher probability of prescribing a branded drug when a generic was available, and also a higher probability of prescribing a contraindicated drug. On the other hand, these kinds of things are kind of mechanically related with entropy in the sense that the more different drugs that you prescribe, the more likely it's going to be that you're going to hit a more expensive one or a branded one or a contraindicated one. So. Um, what might be a problem here is that sicker patients are more, might be more likely to see high entropy providers. Okay, so, for example, if you look at psychiatrists, they have higher entropy than GPs. And if you're a sick enough psychiatric patient, eventually you'll get probably referred to a psychiatrist. So you would get an increase in entropy. And that might be associated with the fact that you're a sicker patient. So we would like to look at uh, patient level data. And so for that, I was able to um, get access to claims data from Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is a very large private insurer in the US. So I have basically 99 million members aged 18 to 64. We, uh, they're followed from January 2013 to September 2016. There's about 722,000 members who are treated for depression over that period. And for each of them, we generate a panel 
where we know for every month um, whether they were being treated or not, what drug they were being treated with, and then we can look at what their subsequent medical costs were. And um, it's useful to combine this with the other data that I had that was all of the prescriptions, because um, unlike the, the great Israeli data that you have, in, in the US, um, every insurer only has their own claims. So if I'm a doctor and I see three Blue Cross Blue Shield patients, maybe I saw 100 other patients and gave something to them, but I don't know that from the Blue Cross Blue Shield data. But from the prescription data, I know everything that that doctor prescribed. So I can calculate entropy measures in the prescription data, bring them into the Blue Cross Blue Shield data, and then see how the characteristics of the doctors affect the treatment outcomes. So I'm able to do that for about 74% of the doctors in the Blue Cross Blue Shield sample. Okay. So this data, uh, I end up with about 452,000 members and 5 million some observations, about 12 months of uh, treatment per person, and in about eight of those months, they're being treated for an antidepressant. Uh, and you can see here the costs are very skewed. So these are monthly costs, and at the 50th percentile, they're not that great, but then for the 90th percentile, they start to add up. And out of these people, there's about 2 to 2.5% of them that get uh, hospitalized or go to the ER in any month. Okay. So, it turns out that controlling for the patient characteristics, which I do by putting in patient fixed effect, is very important. So it essentially reverses the sign that I was seeing before. So before I was getting a positive sign uh, on, in, the, in the county level data on entropy, and you see that again here. But then when I put in the patient fixed effect, it switches to negative. So now higher entropy providers are associated with lower total costs. Um, and if I look by type of cost, I see uh, lower non-drug costs as well as drug costs. And I also see a lower probability of going to the emergency room. Okay, so this is a small number, but relative to the, to the mean, it's a pretty significant effect. And this is a really devastating outcome for people. So keeping them out of the, the ER is, is a good thing. So um, a question is then, could I improve the outcomes by implementing some sort of guideline? And it turns out this is a really old problem in the medical literature in general, and, and especially in the psychiatric literature. So people starting in the 1950s were arguing about this. Danny Kahneman has come down very strongly on the side that a computer can usually do better than a psychiatrist, um, which is interesting given his specialty. And uh, on the other hand, people like Frank and Zeckhauser are saying, no, you know, like from an economist's point of view, it doesn't really make sense to limit what a physician can do, right? Uh, and in my model, um, there's a potential that limiting the availability the ability to do experimentation could have a negative outcome. So uh, there are several different prescribing guidelines available, and they're not uh, entirely consistent with each other. This is a very broad overview. Um, if you look at what the uh, English guidelines say, is that they basically say, well, start treating somebody with an SSRI, and then if that doesn't work, switch drug classes. The Canadians have a, a different guideline that kind of refers to the UK guideline, and they say, well, that doesn't actually make any sense as advice, because even within drug categories like SSRIs, there are some drugs that are known to be more effective than other drugs. And they make these tables which show, you know, essentially this drug is better than this drug is better than this drug. <laughs> which is interesting because if you just sort of follow through the logic, there would be some drugs that probably should hardly ever be prescribed because they're all dominated by some other drug. Um, so that's what they say. The uh, American 
psychiatric association is kind of resistant to the idea of having practice guidelines, but they, even they say, well, you know, most patients could be treated using SSRIs, SNRIs, metirzapine, or bupropion. But you might say, well, what's left? Uh, but that actually excludes two drugs that made up about 17.4% of the market. And then one thing that these uh, guidelines have in common is that they're very dubious about what people call drug cocktails or multiple drugs. And there's a lot of concern in the literature about what's called polypharmacy or people getting lots of different kinds of drugs. So just to think about how these guidelines look in the data, here's an example from the American Psychiatric Association. And I'm just most of the guidelines have to do with transitions. So I'm thinking here, here's what you're taking at T, and then here's what you're taking at T plus one. Okay. So the green boxes are saying, well, I'm taking the same thing at T plus one and T. Okay. Um, so along here, the red lines indicate the two drugs that they said that they didn't uh, recommend. So one of them is trazodone, the other in it is amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic uh, antidepressant. And then there's other drugs that aren't listed in any of these guidelines, and there's the cocktails. So what I'm just saying empirically uh, as an interpretation of this guideline is, well, they shouldn't be prescribing any of these things in, in red. And uh, I allowed them to keep prescribing the same thing. Like if you're taking trazodone at time t and you're also taking it at t plus one, I thought, well, maybe that's because it works for you. So who am I to say that it it's, shouldn't be there? So I allowed that as not a violation of the guideline. Now, it's sort of obvious that if you impose a guideline, it's gonna have some effect on entropy scores. So this is just illustrating how imposing the APA guideline would affect entropy scores. The dark blue is the original, and the white is saying, if I impose the APA guideline, what would the distribution of entropy scores look like? So that says it would actually be binding if you um, imposed it. And that's true, even though there's not that many uh, transitions that violate the, gu the US guideline here. Okay, so looking at what effect violating the guideline has, um, this is kind of a busy table. But if you look, for example, at the last column here, whether people were hospitalized for a mental health problem in the specification with patient fixed effects, the UK guideline isn't statistically significant, but violating the US guideline, the Canadian guideline, or prescribing a drug cocktail are all associated with higher probabilities of being hospitalized for a mental health condition. So this is saying that even these kind of crude guidelines seem to be uh, positive in the sense that doctors who don't violate them have better outcomes for their patients. So uh, the last thing that I'm gonna do is think a, a little bit more about the, the model and how I was interpreting this data with the help of some simulations. So in these simulations, I'm gonna think about there being two types of physicians, one of whom I'm going to call short run physicians, and they just want you to feel better now. So they just wanna do whatever is the best thing now. They're still going to learn, they're still gonna be Bayesians, but they don't put any value on experimentation. Okay? And then the other type is going to be uh, somebody who, who likes to experiment and is going to experiment using this UCB algorithm that I explained where they're always trying to pick the thing that has the highest possible outcome for the patient. So, um, yeah, and then one note about this is a physician who has very strong priors is always just gonna choose what they believe to the, be the best. Um, so the priors are important here. And in the simulation, what we're gonna assume is that physician priors are given by data from clinical trials. So the clinical trials give a mean effect for every drug. They also give a variance of the effect of the drugs. And we're gonna assume that doctors know that and follow it, but that's another uh, dimension where people could vary. <clears throat> 
Okay. So what do the clinical trials say about the efficacy of these drugs? Um, in these figures, I'm showing uh, efficacy against the drug market share, just because I thought that was kind of interesting. And here the efficacy is measured by something called the Hamilton score. So this is a test of how depressed you are. And the aim of the treatment is to lower the score so you're less depressed. And so here um, we're showing the effectiveness of these different drugs. So a higher number means that it's more effective. And the interesting thing is that this seems like it has a negative slope, right? So I showed you that sertraline is the highest selling drug. And it's also one that's not that much more effective than placebo. Uh, and another interesting thing about these trials is that placebo has very big effect. So if you do a randomized controlled trial of an antidepressant, you know, 42% of the people will get better on the placebo, and then about 60% of the people will get better with the real drug. Is it just time? Is it the placebo or the time? Well, I mean, in the randomized controlled trial, they're getting the same amount of time with the drug or with the... So some people will get better on their own, yeah. Well. Placebo effects are very complicated, right? So one thing is that you can't give people placebo with nothing, right? You at least have to talk to them, and then you have to evaluate them. You have to do their Hamilton score. You have to show that you care about them by, by seeing how they are, right? So a placebo, it doesn't mean that you get no treatment, usually. It just means that you get no drug, right? So. Anyway, another thing, a key to this puzzle might be that uh, these drugs all have side effects. And so you can also see in the clinical trials the withdrawal rate from the trial. And it turns out that if you, if you put those in a little regression, then you do see a positive effect of, of the efficacy okay, and a big negative effect of the dropout rate. So drugs that have higher side effects have more dropout and a, a big interaction between those two things. So that might be part of the puzzle of why something like sertraline has such a large market share, because it has low side effects, and doctors are being cautious. And, but in any case, going back to the simulation, in addition to having these two types of doctors, we also let doctors vary in terms of how good they are at making a diagnosis. And so we, we pick these numbers fairly arbitrarily, but here, uh, point one means that you're very good at telling how well the person is. And a 10 means that you're terrible at telling how well the patient is. Okay? And then, um, as I mentioned, the beliefs are going to be fixed by this data. And so the things that are varying in the simulation are the doctor's diagnostic skill, the doctor's preference for the present versus the future, which basically depends uh, is, is captured by whether they're short run or following this UCB experimental algorithm. And then also the, the treatment time you're going to see is going to be really important. Okay. So each physician is assumed to see 300 patients in each period. They're drawn from this k-dimensional distribution. So different patients have different optimal drugs. and. Um, then we use the model to calculate the doctor's entropy score over time and also the utility function, which depended on the number of times that somebody did something uh, that was not optimal. Okay, so if you look at the entropy scores over, say, letting it run for three years, uh, you see a big jump. And here, the, the dashed lines are the experimental types, and the solid lines are the short-run types. The red are the high-skill, and the blue are the low-skill. Okay, so the high-skill people who like to experiment just jump into it and start experimenting a lot right away. The low-skill people don't do very much experimentation at all until they see that something really isn't working. Right? And it takes them a long time to catch on that things aren't working because that's sort of how we're defining skill. Okay, so that's what the entropy scores look like. And then the patients, um, and, and actually you can follow it out even over 10 years, and the um, 
if you give it long enough, the low-skilled people should become similar to the high-skilled people and the medium-skilled people, but you can see that at least the way we set this up, it would take a very long time for them to converge to the same place. If you look at the patient utility, I think the interesting thing, uh, if you're thinking about this in terms of, well, would you want to go to different types of doctors? Would I want to go to a doctor who's going to experiment on me? Well, you know, not if I have a fairly short time horizon, because you have a big fall in patient utility, and then eventually it recovers, right? So you might think that these experimental high skill types are the best type to see, but that's true only basically if you want to follow, if you want to stick with them for a year or more. And in the data, most of these people are getting treated for six to eight months, right? So most of them would not uh, want to do this because the short treatment horizon means that it's not really worth it for somebody to experiment with you. Okay, so to conclude then, um, I, I think I've covered a lot of ground here, but hopefully managed to tie it together. So um, there's a lot of academic and public discussion about variations in medical practice between places. And I think that um, that discussion is kind of misguided because a lot of the important variation is within places and between different doctors who are practicing in the same locations. And that it's not something about the locations, it's really something about the doctors, which is different. And so I showed you that there's very little evidence, at least for this particular example, that doctors were more similar to other doctors in the same county than to other doctors who were sort of like them in some way, but outside the county. Also, um, the small area variations literature is very negative about um, variation, essentially, and strongly suggests that you know, everybody should be doing the same thing. But um, at the empirical level, it showed that higher entropy was associated with better patient outcomes once the individual patient fixed effects were controlled for, although you don't want them to go completely wild in the sense that doctors who violate guidelines also have worse outcomes. So you want some variation, but kind of within um, some loose boundaries. The simulations suggested that the relationship between entropy and outcomes depended really strongly on the time horizon. So one of the issues may be that most people aren't staying with the same doctor long enough to get really any benefit of experimentation. So um, patients who are being seen only for a few months or for any but the highest skill level of physicians, so you can think about the psychiatrist versus the GPs or getting antidepressants from your cardiologist, um, people should prefer the kind of short-run physicians who just want to do the highest expected value thing um, to, and ones that follow guidelines versus ones who are more experimental. Okay, so that's, that's it, and I'm really happy to answer any questions. Different graduation is, different theories, different 
Um, no, I, I actually, I'm sure that you're. I'm sure that you're correct. I know that there's a lot of difference by cohort of the doctor, right? So that's one reason why I was comparing doctors to other doctors in the same cohorts because there are big differences by cohort. That's what I mean. That's what I mean by cohort, the graduation year. The comparison is within graduation year, yeah. So what do you think about it? I know that there's big differences by graduation year, so you're right. But isn't the same thing in the conclusion? I mean, Oh, well, I can conclude that too. No, it doesn't totally explain the variation. There's a lot more uh, uniqueness to doctors than just their graduation year. Even within graduation year, they don't all do the same thing. So, so maybe you refer to that, but um, do you, uh, to what extent do these model physicians can learn from the, their entire experience patients across patients? Is that something that we uh, assume the way here? Because it seems important that you know, if I saw enough patients like you, if, even if I'm the experimenter type, I could be basically, you know, like technically a contextual bandwidth model rather than a bandwidth model, right? And kind of infer across people. Yeah, I think that's true, and we haven't modeled that. And one reason why is that there's very little guidance in any of the literature about how you would do that, right? So you could divide patients by age and sex, right? but it's not clear that that's really the most meaningful variation. Some people think that the frontier would be to do some sort of genetic profiling and find people maybe who have different gene mutations and then maybe there's some medicine that works better for some types than others, but there's essentially no information about that. So I don't know how doctors could validly infer anything from what they observe in their own practice, but maybe they're invalidly inferring a bunch of stuff. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I've, I sort of went over it quickly, but some of the models are estimated by specialty, especially looking at GPs and psychiatrists separately. And you do see that psychiatrists on average have higher entropy, but even within psychiatrists and within GPs, the same kind of patterns hold. So it is true that there's some, some level differences, but then there still is a lot of variation even within specialty about how much experimenting is going on. Right, so that's one, reason, that's one reason to do a simulation is that the data is kind of imperfect and then there's problems like that, right? So in the simulation, the patient is staying with the same person for like 10 years and in the data that almost never happens, right? But I think it does still shed some light on maybe why those treatment periods are so short in the sense that, you know, if somebody if you go to the doctor because you feel terrible and then they give you some drug and it makes you feel 10 times worse, then maybe you quit seeing that person, right? So I, I think it gives perhaps some insight into why you would have uh, a lot of switching. 
<laughs> okay, thank you all very much. <laughs>